All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Tonight, we are going to continue looking at the sutra that we started last week. So last week, we started reading this uh, Mahatanha Samkhya Sutta, the larger discourse on the destruction of craving. Two weeks ago, we did the little, the tiny discourse, the shorter discourse on the destruction of craving. And of course, this is the longer version, so it's going to take us a little longer. Um, so let me quickly just remind us of what happened last week with this sutra, and then we're going to pick up where we left off. We have, a, I, I think, a very interesting topic to discuss tonight. Um, if you weren't here last week, we are still reading from the middle-length discourses from the Majjhima Nikaya. Uh, this is sutta number 38. Uh, and again, this is the Maha Tanha Samkhya Sutta. So a really quick kind of recap of what happened. So this sutta starts with, well, it's one of those suttas where there's a monk with a pernicious view. And we've encountered this kind of sutta before. We've read a, uh, at least one sutta like this recently where there was somebody who had a erroneous view or a pernicious view and all the other practitioners, all the other monks tried to, tried to get them to not have that view. And so they wound up going to the Buddha. Now in this sutta that we're reading tonight, the monk named Sati, he has this erroneous view or this per, uh, pernicious view. And it's the view that it's this consciousness that undergoes reincarnation. It's this consciousness that receives the karmic retribution in the future. Might be positive, might be negative, but sati thinks that it's this vijnana, this consciousness that goes on to the next birth. And that's the wrong view. That's the pernicious view. And so they all, all the monks go to the Buddha and the Buddha explains, I've never, ever said that about consciousness. Like, I don't know where you got that view from. And then what the Buddha makes clear is that he has always explained that consciousness is dependently arisen. And that was primarily what we focused on kind of last Sunday night was, well, we were sort of toggling back and forth between these two views of consciousness. Sati has this idea that the consciousness that you are, you know, that you are listening to this now with, Sati thinks that this consciousness that's listening to me now, that this will be the same consciousness that will be listening to me next week. If, if, you, if you happen to come back next week, Sati thinks it's the same consciousness next week that will be listening to me. And if you come to Dharma Doors next month, it'll be the same consciousness. And of course, if you come years and years from now, Sati, this monk, thinks it'll be the same consciousness. The Buddha has been explaining or explained, no, consciousness is dependently arisen and it's dependent upon whatever is being sensed. So whatever you are in sensual, sensory contact with through your body and your eyes and your ears and your nose and your tongue, whatever you're in contact with right now is giving rise to a state of consciousness that is aware of, of this now. But the point is, this consciousness is the 
arising from these senses. It, this is not the consciousness that can be here next week. <laughs> because next week, the consciousness will be arising based upon that stimulation. This is what's arising based on this stimulation. So that's the basic kind of idea that the Buddha was trying to get across, was that he teaches that consciousness is dependently arisen, not an entity that's cruising through space and time, receiving all kinds of experiences. No, it is the arising of experience in this moment. So that was the kind of the basic idea. And we went through the Buddha's description of how it is that consciousness is dependently arisen. We will probably have a reason to talk about some of that again. Um, and then the last thing that we talked about was this section here. If you happen to have the wisdom publication edition over on page 352, section nine, it's this... <laughs> what what um what they label as the general questionnaire on being <laughs> and this is where the buddha kind of asks the monks so you know how do you see it now how do you see this present state of consciousness and that section is about well basically clarifying what i just summarized you can either think in terms of a self, and then again, the idea is, is that it will be that self that will be here next week and next month and years later on. So you can have that idea that it, there's a self, or you can have the idea that there is this. In the language of the sutta, as we read it last week, this has come to be. <laughs> Do you see it? <laughs> Do you see that this has come to be? Not I am, but this has come to be. It's, it's so subtle, but it's a huge difference. And again, it's the difference between the idea of like, I'll see you next week <laughs> versus this is happening now. So that's what that general questionnaire was about. And it kind of was about, well, it was about a few things regarding like ideas of doubt. The Buddha explained that what constitutes doubt is not being entirely sure about that. Like meaning per, you're thinking, well, but it, it might be me next week. It might be me in this consciousness next month. I'm not so sure. So the Buddha kind of explains that as doubt in that way. All right. So the thing about it is, is that last week, we didn't actually get to the Tanha. And if you remember, the name of this sutra is the destruction of Tanha, the destruction of craving. But the, we hadn't even mentioned craving yet. So that's where we want to jump in tonight on page 353 if you happen to have it i'm going to be at section 15 and what we're going to be talking about tonight is what is translated as nutriment and of course dependent origination so the main topic tonight i would say is going to be this idea of ahara ahara a h a r a ahara is this word that's translated as nutriment. And nutriment, that's kind of pretty much what it means. Um, let's take a peek real quick. So again, I'm reading from section 15, and this is coming on the heels of all of this discussion about the nature of consciousness. Oh, and by the way, when the Buddha was describing in the general questionnaire on being, when he was describing this idea of this has come to be. Another part of that was that a bhikkhu, a practitioner, understands that 
this which has come to be, its origin occurs with that as a nutriment. And the Buddha never explained in that section what nutriment meant. And I kind of explained it last week by saying, well, right now all we need to think about is that what the Buddha is talking about is that this state of consciousness is arising dependent upon something. It's not coming out of nowhere. It's not just coming out of empty space, so to speak, but it's dependent upon something. And so this which has come to be is dependent upon certain nutriments. And now the Buddha explains what those nutriments are. And he says, bhikkhus, there are these four kinds of ahara. There are these four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the support of those about to come to be. What for? They are physical food as nutriment, gross or subtle, contact as the second nutriment, what they translate as mental volition as the third nutriment, and consciousness as the fourth nutriment. Let's just talk about nutriment because the Buddha is not going to say much more about it. So let's talk about it. So the topic of nutriment is something that gets discussed quite a bit, or at least I've seen it a lot in the early teachings. So in the Pali Canon, in the suttas, they talk about these four nutriments a lot. In the Mahayana tradition, though, I, I don't come across this that often in Mahayana sutras. So it seems to be a kind of, you know, earlier teaching in that way. And as the Buddha noted, there are these four nutriments for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the support of those who are about to come to be. Now, this is a teaching, this teaching of nutriment. From all the things I've studied about it, it can definitely be read and understood at a few different levels. And what I mean is, is that on, on the one hand, the Buddha is talking about beings, creatures, animals, and what have you, that either exist or that they might be like in the womb and they're about to exist in that way. So whether it is a being that is existent or about to exist, so in a, in a, like a gestation state, all beings need are, are like dependent upon four nutriments to exist. The first of those is food. And there's a way in which as, as people, as eaters, I think we understand the necessity for food in that way. That, you know, even if we don't like food, unfortunately, we need to eat it in order to survive. Now, what kind of food that is, that'll, you know, depend, of course, on diet and things. But what I mean, though, is that the food nutriment, the first nutriment, it's physical food, but you know, it could be, it could be a lot of things. And what I'm getting at is, is that it could be even more, oh, you know, uh, even if it's like, um, you know, just a few almonds a day, let's say. A, a lot of yogis, a lot of like, you know, hardcore kind of meditators live off of very little but they still need some nutriment, some food in that way. Now, the Buddha also notes in this one about how all beings require these four nutriments 
The first being physical food as a nutriment, but then he notes it could be gross or subtle. So I want to just kind of let you know what, how I understand that, the, the way that that's normally interpreted. The Buddha is not just talking about mammals. <laughs> Buddha is not just talking about humans in that way. The Buddha is talking about any kind of being. And that would include ghosts, gods, spirits, other kinds of um, perhaps non-corporal beings. But the thing about gods and ghosts and spirits, traditionally they are understood that they, they too still need the nutriment of food. By the way, if you want, this is Kabalinka, Kabalinka Ahara, uh, physical food. But when the Buddha talks about subtle forms of food, one of the things that you should be aware of if you're kind of in the world of Buddhism, it's helpful to know that a lot of spirits, a lot of kind of like ghostly apparitional type of spirit beings in the world of Buddhism, they eat incense. And so when you burn incense, it is actually making a food offering to beings that have very, very subtle bodies to the point where just smelling those things is a nutriment for them. And that is traditionally what it seems the Buddha is referring to when he talks about subtle nutriment. Because there are some beings that don't need physical food, like regular food, but they still need this kabalinka ahara. And so again, that could be something in the something like incense. There's also um, light light eaters. So offering lamps or candles, the light is nutriment for certain beings. Again, if you're in the world of Buddhism, you should know this, that this is sort of a thought that's going on when we're making offerings of incense, that it's a food offering for some. All right, so that's this idea that no food, eventually no being in that way. So the that which is, that which has arisen, is dependent upon the nutriment of food. But that's just one of three nutriments, or one of four nutriments. The next nutriment is, well, it's, how did they translate it? Yeah, contact, sparsha. Uh, I forget how to say it. I guess it's pahasa, pahasa ahara in Pali, sparsha ahara in Sanskrit. And this is this idea that all beings, in order to exist, in order to be, they require the nutriment of food, and they also require the nutriment of contact. Now, when I said earlier that this teaching of the four nutriments, I said that you can kind of interpret this on a few different levels. On one level, on a kind of a very basic level, you could interpret this as that the Buddha is talking about how all beings in a way need to be touched and need to touch. And it's a nutriment. And of course, there's a way in which, you know, we we sort of know this, maybe, maybe we know this instinctually, but we know like for, if you have a baby, like a human baby, you cannot just feed it. It needs contact. Like it really needs the contact as a, as a nutriment. And so I think that that's a good, well, it's one way to think about it. It's an interesting example. This idea of, of physical contact in that way as a nutriment, as something that nourishes you. I think that's a beautiful idea. And I like that interpretation. 
But there's another interpretation, which is sort of actually at a deeper, almost like existential level. And it's this idea that in order for something to be and be in a state of existence, it actually needs to be in contact with something. Otherwise, there it, it can't have any existence in that way. We could go even deeper with that, but I think we, we are going to anyways, because we're going to start talking about dependent origination in a moment. So let's just kind of keep it at this basic idea that the first nutriment that all beings need is food, and the second one is contact with something in that way. So the third nutriment is a very tricky one. So the third nutriment is, well, so they translate it, Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it here as mental volition. And that in a way would be a fine translation, except Bhikkhu Bodhi tends to use the word volition and mental volition in a way to refer to samskara, a kind of conditioning. Uh, he'll use the language of volitional formations. And indeed, this third nutriment is very much related to, to that. It's, it's kind of, it's related to the idea of samskara, but it's not samskara. The third nutriment is something called mano sanchitana. So mano, like mind or thought. And then the word is S-A-N-C-E-T-A-N-A. -A -A. Sanchitana. And this is a really interesting word. Sanchitana is usually translated as something along the lines of continuity or like a kind of... Uh, perpetuating. It's why Bhikkhu Bodhi is translating it as mental volition. Mano Sanchitana is indeed mental volition in that way. I just don't want anybody to get confused that we're talking about samskara. We're talking about this kind of, well, actually this will, I wanted to mention this and I have just enough time. So this idea of the of the continuity. So a way to think about this is, and it has a lot to do with my opening remarks when I summarized the opening of the sutra. And I was talking about the idea of there being this, like this state of consciousness, right? That is a that is arisen from all the stimuli in that way. But what I was talking about or and what the sutra is talking about is not getting confused and thinking that this consciousness is what will be here next week. And what the way to think about that is that Buddhism talks about this idea of a thought moment. And in fact, Buddhism measures time. The smallest increments of time in Buddhism are a thought moment. And a thought moment is a present state of consciously arisen awareness. And again, that state of consciously arisen awareness is based upon what you are sensorily in contact with. But the sensations that you're in contact with are constantly changing. And therefore the arisen state of consciousness is constantly changing right along with it in that way. So what Buddhism talks about is a present state of mind, a mind moment that leads to the next mind moment, which leads to the next mind moment and the next mind moment. And the way that you could think about these mind moments is like 
the classic example of a row of dominoes, where one mind moment knocks another mind moment sort of into existence. And it's not the same state of consciousness, but it has a karmic relationship to the prior state of consciousness because, because it was that, it's this. And because it's like this, it's like this. Now, let's think about that row of dominoes. And what I want you to be thinking about is how this domino is not this domino, which is not this domino, which is not this domino, which is not this domino. Okay. Now, let's say I hit the first domino and all like the dominoes are falling, right? What I want you to be thinking about is is there movement? Is, is there movement? What's moving? What is the, what is moving? Like, as you see this snaking and all these dominoes, there's the appearance of almost like a snake. If you can visualize that row of dominoes falling there, there is the appearance of movement. But what's moving? Movement is moving. Is that what Maria is that you said? Wonderful. Movement is moving. Exactly. But if you look at it, you realize, oh yeah, this domino, which is not this domino, which is not this domino, but then there's this momentum, a kind of flow or continuity, if you will. Well, that's what mano sanchitana is is the, the movement of the dominoes of mind moments in which there is no thing that is underneath that is moving, but as Maria said, but there is the movement, the movement is moving. And this is really kind of interesting because, well, it's interesting for a lot of reasons, but it's particularly interested, interesting in this context of nutriment, because basically what it's saying is, is that like, if that first domino is just sitting there and it doesn't have the momentum to hit the next domino, you're not going to have a being. You're not going to have what this idea of a, of an existent being in that sense. So that, that very momentum, that very movement is a nutriment that is a necessary nutriment for beings, whether they're in a womb or they're already existent in that way. And then the fourth nutriment is consciousness, vijnana. And vijnana is an interesting nutriment in that way. And it kind of speaks to, well, the basic idea is, is that the very first of these, like food, food is kind of like, well, truly, as the sutra says, it's gross, meaning it's obvious. But as you get into things like contact, it's gross, meaning obvious, but perhaps not as, as obvious as food. It's a little more subtle that way, insofar as it is a nutriment. It's a little more subtle, but not as subtle as the nutriment of mano sanchitana. <laughs> not as subtle as this kind of momentum of thought. But then perhaps the most subtle of these nutriments is consciousness. Consciousness as a nutriment that there in a way almost needs to be some sort of thinking going on in that way. All right. So those are the four ahara, these four nutriments. And again, these are 
the nutriments for the maintenance, the maintaining of beings that have already come to be, or for the support of those about to come to be. All right. Any questions about these four nutriments before we find out why the Buddha is telling us about these four nutriments? Okay. So the Buddha says, now bhikkhus, these four kinds of nutriment have what as their source? Have what as their origin? And from what are they born and produced? These four kind of nutriment have tanha, craving, as their source. Craving as their origin. They are born and produced from craving. And just to give you a sense of where we're going to go after this, the Buddha says, and this craving has what as its source, right? This craving has what as its origin? This craving is born and produced from what in that way? And the Buddha is going to say that this craving has vedana, sensations or feelings as its source, as its origin. Okay, and then... We're going to go back. And if you don't know, this is the 12 link chain of dependent origination. And this is exactly what the Buddha is talking about right now. Um, so this is kind of a classic representation of the 12 link chain of dependent origination. Ignore that consciousness is highlighted. This is from a different class I teach. But I want you to notice that the Buddha is over here talking about Tanha, craving, that thirst. And he's about to go back through the 12 link chain of dependent origination. And he's going to be asking these series of questions, which is, all right, food and contact and, you know, thought momentum and consciousness. Where do those come from? What do they have as a base? And the Buddha's answer here is that they all four of them have craving as the base. Tanha. And then this idea is, well, and this craving has what as a source. And what we want to be thinking about, and I want to kind of put this back into context, we want to be thinking about this idea of dependency, but in particular, what I mean is, is that we want to be thinking about it in terms of, it's about this idea that if, if you have craving, then you will have these four nutriment things going on. No craving, though. No nutriments in that way. And then the Buddha is going to say, but where does that craving depend? Where does that craving rest? What does it depend upon? And the one below that, the link in the chain below that, the dependency, is this idea of vedana, sensations. Let's just work with that right there. What one way to understand this is so a sensation, a vedana, is about having a positive, negative, or neutral reaction to a sensory stimuli. So the idea here is, is that, oh, and uh, let me just show you, I'll just show it to you really quick. Or actually, I don't even need to get that. I often use this as an example. You've probably seen it before, but if you haven't, the idea here is, is I've got something right over there. Do you crave it? 
do you, are you like so thirsty for it? <laughs> and what you realize is, is that, well, I don't have a craving for whatever it is because I haven't had a sensation of it. I haven't actually, well, first of all, and I'm, I'm kind of giving you a sneak peek to the next of these, but you haven't come into contact with what I have over here. You haven't had contact with it yet. So you haven't had a sensation to know whether you like it and would like to like, you know, look at it more, or maybe it's a song and you might want to listen to it more, or maybe it's food that you want to eat, or maybe it's a smell you want to, you know, but the idea is that before you've had contact, you don't have a sensation. And without a sensation of something, you cannot develop a craving for it. So in other words, no sensation, no craving. And then what the Buddha is talking about is no craving, no nutriments. Now we're going to, I'm going to kind of go through the 12 link chain here, and then we're going to kind of do a big summary of how this relates to the nutriments in that way. But we want to kind of be tracing back, again, these kind of dependencies. And so the question again becomes, well, upon what is having a, a sense of liking or a sense of not liking or a sense of neutrality what does that, so what does sensing depend upon? And if we look here, and, and this feeling, and this sensation has what as its source? And the Buddha tells us, of course, that feeling or sensation, vedana, has sparsha, has contact as its source. And that's what we were just talking about. No contact, no sensation. No sensation, no craving. All right. Where, where does contact come from? What is the necessary condition in order for there to be contact? And this contact, what does it have as a source? Ah, contact has the six-fold sense bases as its source. So these are the sadayatana, sadayatana, the six bases, the six ayatana. And these are, of course, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mental faculty, the brain, or the mind. So those are the six sense bases. And... The idea here is, is that if you don't have at least one of the six sense bases, what would there be to come into contact with something? Oh, right. You need a sensory organ in order for there to be contact. And it's that contact that is the necessary condition for a sensation. It's the sensation that's the necessary condition for their development of craving. Okay. We've got the six senses. What are the six senses, the six ayatana, the six sense bases? What are they dependent upon? And of course, the idea is, is that the six-fold sense base now, Bhikkhu Bodhi translates this as that it has mentality and materiality as its source. Now, that's a particular translation of this term nama rupa. Nama rupa is more commonly translated as name and form. Nama rupa, namas and rupam, or nam, name and form. So I've taught the 12 link chain of dependent origination a number of times in Dharma doors. And many of you have heard me talk about it a lot. And 
this particular relationship, the six sense bases that are based upon this idea of nama rupa, name and form. Name and form, nama rupa is probably, it's probably the trickiest of the 12 link chain of causation, that particular one. And I say that because when I mention the eyes, the ears, nose, tongue, body, brain, everybody out there is probably like, yep, I know exactly what you're talking about, Michael. I know exactly what eyes and ears and noses are. When I'm talking about contact, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about liking something or not liking something, you probably know what I'm talking about. And when I talk about craving, needing something really badly or desperately, you probably also know what I'm talking about. But Nama Rupa? In English, in like Western uh, vocabulary, the Western lexicon, we don't really talk about Nama Rupa. We don't have it as a, as an idea. So this one's a little trickier to kind of understand in that way because we don't have a, a correlate exactly so nama rupa is of course a very well it's an interesting two ideas put together so the basic idea is is that nama namas it points to that which is related to the mind versus rupa which indicates the physical now in western philosophy in western science there is what is called the mind body problem the mind body problem in western thinking and western psychology psychology philosophy and everything the mind body problem is what is the relationship between the physical world and the mental world? Meaning, there's one school of thought, which is that what we call thinking, what we call mind, what we call consciousness, there's one school of thought that says that mind consciousness, that is a very complicated bioelectrical chemical reaction. There's, there's kind of one school of modern thinking that says consciousness or mind is actually a bioelectrical chemical reaction. In other words, there is only the physical. Period. Atoms, electrons, protons, neutrons, elements, particles, dancing together in a kind of, you know, chaotic dance of physics and there is a kind of i don't know what it is but there's a phenomena of consciousness or mind that is arising but it is a physical event that's one possibility the other possibility is that this is entirely a mental event and part of the mental event is to think in terms of physicality. But we're never actually in the physical. We are just sort of always in a mental realm in which one category of thought is the idea of the physical. But we're never actually in the physical world. So there, there's those two schools of thought, which is that mind is just physical or the physical is actually just mind. But then the mind-body problem is how do you bridge that gap? How do you reconcile those two worlds, the, meaning the mental and the physical? Western philosophy has a problem about that. And they still have a problem about what exactly consciousness is in that way. In Buddhism, well, at least in early Buddhism, they just kind of easily summarized it with this idea of, Nama Rupa, mental, physical. 
and mental physical was sort of well both <laughs> it was the mind and the body but it gets a little more complicated than that and what it is is that it has to do with name and form nama rupa and an interesting way to think about it is it has to do with the idea of, oh, by the way, nama or namas, which I said is about the, the mind, right? Versus rupa, the physical. An aspect of namas, the mind, is names. It's actually where the word name, the English word name is coming from the Sanskrit namas. So the idea of a name for something. A very interesting thing to think about is the relationship between characteristics and names. And what I mean is, is that if you think about, if you think about like a basketball, so there I have a word Right, I have the word, a basketball. And actually, let's just call it a ball, right? You don't need to know it as whether it's what kind of ball. It's just a ball. So the ball is the name. But a ball is a shape as well, right? Well, the interesting thing to ask about a ball an interesting thing to ask is what's in the shape of a ball? And don't say the ball. <laughs> if you just kind of meditate on that, that idea of what's in the shape of a ball. And then you realize, oh, Nama Rupa is one thing. And what I'm getting at is, is like a ball. A ball is both the name and the form of it. And those two are actually kind of inextricable, inalienable in a way. And this is the, this is another big problem in Western philosophy, which is a, the language problem, which is this idea of, well, what is being called a ball? And again, you can't say the ball because I'm asking, no, 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 what's being called a ball? And we realize that without the rupa, if, if I take away the rupa, the form, what, you, don't get the, you don't get a name anymore because I took away the form. So the, in other words, the name of something and its shape are, again, inalienable or inextricably related. And the Buddha or Buddhism seems to have realized this a long time ago about the nature of language. By the way, if you get really into Plato and you get really into the idea of the ideal forms, the Plato is talking about the problem of language and form in that way. And he's talking about this idea of like, what, uh, what are these ideal forms? So Plato's in, in, talking about this. Buddhism has its own answer to this. And so the idea is, is that in order to basically differentiate a sound from a flavor, from a sight, from a tactile object, in order to divide those from each other, I need the basis of the language game of name and form. If I don't have the language game of name and form, if I get rid of that, I no longer have the cognitive tools I need to explain to myself hearing versus seeing. 
I I started by saying this is the most complicated link in the 12 link chain of causation, nama rupa. For again, for simplicity's sake, you can understand nama rupa as language, what I'm calling the language game. And what I want you to notice is, is that if you don't have the language game, you can't talk about the six senses. So there's a language game that is a prerequisite. It is a, it is a necessary condition in order for there to be this dividing of sensory experience into six flavors, such as seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and then thoughts. All right, questions about Nama Rupa. And of course, I'm giving you much more than the sutra gave. Yeah, Mar yeah Maria. Can you hear me? Um, oh, I just had a comment. I think it's interesting to think about this in the context of the teachings um, after the Buddha decided to teach and that it works for ideas as well. And so if you know, people kind of had to have the scaffolding in order to receive the te the teachings. And so um, you have to have something to call that idea before you can sort of move on that, build on that and move on to the next idea. Um, and so I have a lot more thoughts about this. My mind was kind of blown after the last um, Dharma door. So, um, but I'll leave it at that for now. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Excellent summary, Maria. In the past, I've mentioned that there's these very interesting studies um, around the language of colors and then the ability to see those colors in particular, there's studies around the color pink and cultures where they don't have a distinction for the color pink. Those people who speak the language that lacks that word, in given a color wheel, they cannot identify the, it's, it's a, you know, it's all red. But if somebody has the word pink, they're like, no, those are red, and that's the pink one. So you're having a word for it is what, and exactly what Maria was just saying, you're having a word for it is what allows you to then experience that. And so what we want to notice is, is that this is, the Buddha, Buddhism's talking about it at a deep level, where it's like, you got to have to have a whole, you have to have a whole vocabulary of sights, sounds, flavors, tactile sensations and all of that in order for then something to happen to you and then to process it and you to be like, oh, I liked that color pink. So for you to have a sensation, a positive sensation that's coming from contact from the six senses, that's founded on having a kind of language game to differentiate all of that. So that's our Nama Rupa. What is the necessary condition for the language game, for Nama Rupa? What is the base of that? So, and this mentality slash materiality or hyphen materiality has what as its source? Mentality materiality has vijnana, consciousness, as its source. So, the idea is, is that now we're talking about a, a conscious state of awareness that is playing the language game, that is thinking in language. So what we want to notice is, is again, is it, if this one is the idea of a consciousness that is playing the language game and then differentiating sensory experience into six different kinds, which is what how we get contact and sensations, 
So if consciousness is playing the language game and there's no consciousness, how could there be Nama Rupa? And, and this is where I think it's very helpful to think of Nama Rupa as language, as the language game, because if there's no consciousness thinking, the language game isn't going to play itself in that way. So there needs to be this kind of consciousness in order for there to be the playing of the language game that divides sensory experience into six kinds, which is then the means by which we have contact and sensations and then develop craving. <laughs> Where does consciousness come from? What is the origin of consciousness? What is the foundation of consciousness? Well, consciousness has samskara. What they translate here as formations, also sometimes called volitional formations. I call it conditioning, or there's a lot of other terms for this samskara. But the idea is, is that samskara is the necessary condition for there to be consciousness that then plays the language game and differentiates sensory experience. So now what we want to look at is how is it that this samskara thing is the necessary condition for consciousness? Well, the first thing we want to remember is, is that the word vijnana, although it's translated as consciousness, remember it's something, well, it's its own word is what I want to stress right now because of where we're about to go for the, the rest of the evening. I want to make it really clear that in the world of Buddhism, vijnana or consciousness is always subject object oriented. Chitta. So there's this other word, chitta which means mind, mind, the mind, needn't be subject object. Mind normally is kind of very influenced by consciousness in that way. And therefore mind normally default mode thinks in terms of subject object, but mind needn't. Mind can be non-dual. Mind can be beyond. Vijnana, though, is always a subject being conscious of something. So my point is, is that I, I really want to stress that Vijnana is... It's basically, by its very nature, faulty or distorted because of the duality, because of the subject-object relationship, consciousness is always distorted. And again, that influences states of mind that are normally distorted. But if you get rid of all of the subject-object stuff and you kind of get into a non-dual state, there's no more vijnana because there's no more subject being aware of object. And so when you're in a non-dual state, you, we are strictly talking about chitta, mind. And it's why the Buddha talks about states of mind. Yeah, no. Is, is when, we, when we say vijnana as consciousness, and we're, but we're distinguishing that from mind, from chitta, the, is the vijnana consciousness limited to the six sense bases that each have their consciousness there's no like other it's like not in vijnana right not, not in early buddhism in, in early buddhism there is only the six vijnanas that correspond to the six sensory organs yeah and it's in mahayana that you kind of get the talk of a kind of gestalt vijnana like a singular vijnana, which would be a kind of selfing vijnana, 
this uh, like they call it the seventh consciousness or the seventh vijnana okay but that's all very technical and it's, but not, it's still not it's not chitta it still belongs to the to the selfing oh and in uh, and on that level in all forms of buddhism vijnana is always faulty right. no matter so, what kind of vijnana it is so kind of a, a a a basic issue here is that we have one word that we use for both of these that, yeah. that that's very confusing yeah I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I want to kind of, you know, share with with everybody what knowledge I have in that way where, you know, vijnana is about a again, a subject object, but because it's about a sensory organ perceiving some other thing. And so it's always dualistic in that way. And because of the nature of Buddhist teachings where dualistic thinking is faulty it's it's like it's just an appearance that we kind of rest on too hard in that way and so there is this these ways of accessing just chitta mind in that way and i think we will yeah if we keep going we might be able to get there or at least kind of understand the distinctions between these so now that I've said that about vijnana, that it is this always subject-object duality type of thinking, now we might be able to understand better about how it is that this samskara is the foundation or the necessary condition for there to be this kind of discriminatory consciousness. So let's remember that Samskara is, at least for, you know, for me, it's about conditioning. And the simplest way to think of conditioning is just habits, habit energy. And what, and the point of a habit is that it's running on autopilot. A, a habit is a habit. You don't think about it anymore. You just do it. So, in terms of the aggregates, the five skandhas, form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, right? And these are what are making up this present state of conscious awareness is this aggregation of the five skandhas, right? So what you are, and by you, of course, I mean this present state of conscious awareness, what you are is that body of form as it is right now, having those sensations that you're having right now, perceiving what you're perceiving right now based upon those sensations, except the sensations that you're perceiving are all being filtered through your habits, the samskara. And then that so the sensations being perceived, but through the filter of your samskara, that's what the present state of conscious awareness is. So let's keep in mind that samskara is this habit energy, this conditioned habit energy. Well, check this out. A good example of this is Let's say you fall asleep and then you wake up and you're in a dream world, but you don't know you're in a dream. And so there is the samskara, the habitual karmic tendency, this kind of habit energy of subject object. It's a habit to perceive in terms of subject object. And guess what? When you fall asleep and then you wake up in a dream, the moment the mind thinks it sees something, the habit of self is arising from that thing not being you. And now let's say that you were in that dream and you were thinking, I could, I could really use that. I could really use that. 
what I want you to notice is, is that in the dream, your conscious, the conscious state of awareness, the vijnana, is sitting there thinking, I, I really want that thing. But notice that that consciousness is arising based upon the habitual conditioned behavior of thinking in terms of subject object, when that's not actually what's happening in a dream. But the habit of subject object relationships, that habit, that samskara is what is giving rise to your present state of conscious awareness in a dream. And then in the dream, that consciousness plays the language game of like, ooh, look, it's round, spherical, it's a basketball. So now the discriminatory consciousness in the dream is playing the language game and then might come into contact with the basketball and then like the basketball and desire the basketball and then crave the basketball. So notice that the tanha, the craving for the basketball came from having a contact sensation through my sensory organs, or was it, through my sensory organs, based upon the language game that said, this is me, that's a basketball, and then the consciousness based upon conditioning that was giving rise to all of that. And what I want you to notice right now is I want you to notice the very, very precarious house of cards upon which craving is based. Because notice how I just kind of described the fantasy, the fantasy world of a dream in which you might grow desirous of something. You might grow a, 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 a craving for something in a dream, even though there's not anything there to be craved, nor is there a you there in that dream world that would actually benefit from that. But notice the perpetuation of the delusion in a dream. Notice what's keeping it going. At the very bottom, well, not at the very bottom, but almost at the very bottom, it's habits, conditioning, that is keeping the whole show going. And what, as the Buddha says, and what, are these formations or these habits, these samskaras, what do they have as their source? What's their origin? From whence are they born and produced? Samskara formations have ignorance as their source. Ignorance is their origin. They are born and produced from ignorance. So we've now made it to the very bottom of this kind of 12 link chain of dependent origination where it's all resting on ignorance. Now, allow me to go back to my dream example for a moment. The reason why I'm always using the dream as an, as an analogy, it's because dream states are an excellent, excellent analogy for ignorance. And I say that because when you're in a dream, but you don't know it's a dream and you're acting as if it's your real life, that's ignorance. That's a great example of ignorance. You're sitting there worrying about things or chasing after things or running away from things. And you're doing all of that in a dream when you don't need to be, but you don't know it. So now that's ignorance, being in a dream, but not knowing you're in a dream. So that's the bottom of this 12 link chain of dependent origination, the ignorance, the not knowing what's going on. But now what I want you to notice is, is this, notice that I fall asleep, I wake up in a world, it's a dream world, but I don't know it. So there's the ignorance. And then I see a basketball. 
And what I want you to notice is, is that the ignorance, the ignorance is, is that I, I don't know I'm dreaming. Okay, that's the ignorance. But notice that the moment in the dream, the moment I'm like, ooh, what's that over there? The ignorance has now conditioned itself. In other words, I'm perpetuating the delusion of the dream by behaving in a way that's ignorant of the dream. When, when I'm in a dream and I see something and I'm like, ooh, I want to go get that. I'm, I'm producing karmic thoughts that are thinking it's reality, but it's not reality. But notice that the delusional thinking is perpetuating it. So now I have the beginning state of ignorance, but I don't know what's going on. And from that, I keep behaving ignorantly. And it's from that. And now notice that I'm in a dream world. Conscious. Oh, look, there's that over there. I could get that. So now I'm conscious. But am I conscious? What I, what I mean is, is like, Am I consciously aware of the basketball? No, not exactly because there's not a basketball. There's not a me. But notice that the state of consciousness in the dream doesn't know that. So that's the vijnana, which is based upon the samskara, which is based upon the ignorance. And it just keeps perpetuating itself. So now I'm in a dream talking about basketballs that are round. <laughs> so I'm playing the language game in my dream world about the dream objects. And without going through all of the steps we've been through, I, what I really want you to notice is, is how all of that leads to craving. And I want you to notice that that state of craving is me not just wanting the basketball, but needing it like craving it desperately. Now, the funny thing about this craving for the basketball that's in my dream, the funny thing about it is there's nothing there. There's no basketball. Yet there I am craving the basketball. Do you see how per self-perpetuating it is in that way? So what I want us to notice is, and then Jenny, I definitely want to hear your question, but I just want you to notice how quickly craving could disappear. Because it's not there to begin with in that way. We'll get back to that in a second. Jenny, do you have a question or a comment or an idea? Thank you, Noam. Um, all right, I personally, in my dreams, it's not where I'm craving the basketball because the basketball is constantly changing it's in my real life that or this waking life whatever this like whichever is the dream world like in my dream world i'm more settled there's not the i don't have craving i don't like it's just some weird continuation continually morphing thing but um I mean, just a week ago, it occurred to me here in this like realm that like, oh, that's this whole thing I've been studying about attachment actually applies to me. So it's interesting to talk about like the dream world versus this world, because it's this world where I have suffering as a, you know, because I'm attached because, but in my dream world, I'm just like, oh, and then now this is happening. <laughs> yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So thank you. And also too, I just want to go to the thing about language and what you were talking about with color. That yeah. is brilliant. Like I love, I just love language. And we've talked about this before about translation and depending on who who's translating and what they're conditioning, but just about how we have words so that we can have experience. That's what I heard you say, right? Okay. All right. That's it. Unmute. No, no. Awesome. Or mute. <laughs> so Jenny, I totally, totally appreciate what you're saying about your dream life. Wonderful. The dream, of course, is just an analogy. And right. I want to make clear that the analogy is for this, this reality here, what we call this waking life here. So let me now take the analogy and bring it to this life. Because what I want to make clear is, is here's the idea. The idea here is, is that I know that it might seem like I have a roll of toilet paper in my hand and that the roll of toilet paper is not you, right? So you, so you seeing this roll of toilet paper is this conscious vijnana subject object relationship where you think you're you and then you think you're looking at a roll of toilet paper. But what we, the reason why I use this all the time is because I want to make it really clear that the only place there's a roll of toilet paper is in the language game being played in the conscious discrimination over there. Now, that language game of a roll of toilet paper, I might be playing that language game too, meaning I might be conditioned the same way you're conditioned. And so if I say, what is this? And you say a roll of toilet paper. And I say, ah, I thought it was a roll of toilet paper too. It must inherently be a roll of toilet paper then, right? Because you said it and I said it. No, it just means we're both conditioned in the same language game to call certain shapes the same thing. But what I'm getting at is, is that you might still think that there's a roll of toilet paper in my hand. Not the idea of a roll of toilet paper over there in your mind. What I'm getting at is, is that the ignorance is that there's a roll of toilet paper over here, really, that it's really over here. And every time you keep thinking that, there's the samskaric condition of roll of toilet paper, roll of toilet paper, roll of toilet paper, roll of toilet paper. And so if at any point you're like, huh, Michael has a roll of toilet paper in his hand, (laughs) by which I mean that you're consciously thinking of the roll of toilet paper. Well, that consciousness is arising from the conditioning of you thinking it's a roll of toilet paper, the ignorant state of that. And what I'm getting at is that if you follow this up the chain, which is that there isn't a roll of toilet paper here, but you have thought there is and you keep thinking there is, you can see where you could now become desirous of my roll of toilet paper. Like you could crave it, but I want you to notice what you're craving. You're not craving the roll of toilet paper out there because it's not out there (laughs) in that sense. So that's how it is that this reality is like a dream in that way. Because these ideas are our ideas in that sense. We keep thinking the ideas are out there, though, in that way. And that's just like in a dream, thinking that the basketball is out there in that sense. Questions, comments, answers, ideas. Yeah, Maria. I was just putting in the chat, and so I'll just say it. Um, it seems that uh, realization or um, freedom from ignorance is a process of unlearning 
as much as it's a process of learning, um, learning how to unravel all of the samskaras and all of the conditions um, stuff. And uh, I keep going round and round about this idea of how, how path opens up to sort of meet our, the path rises to meet you. You know, it sort of meets our understanding as we're able to grasp it. Um, and um, I think about this in the context of how the teachings come and that there are maybe multiple levels that they're being received at the same time, depending on who's listening to them. Um, and this idea of like, the more you go in, the deeper your understanding goes, sort of the mind, the more the consciousness expands and sort of the mind expands, kind of goes all the way in and all the way out in that way. Um, I, I don't know, I'm yeah. kind of spinning out here, but um, the next comment I have after that sort of ramble is the unknowing of reality is enlightenment, I think. And I think that's what Dogen's talking about in um, his book, Beyond Thinking. Um, so anyways, not sure if that made any sense. <laughs> crystal, crystal clear to me. Um, you, in fact, you, you reminded me of something, a very important point. So I'm going to uh, piggyback off something you just said. So it was about what your comment about unlearning. And I would want to kind of tweak that a little bit and note, and I would want to put it in terms of that. As my understanding of the Dharma and Buddhism, it, grows like, as I continue to teach, as I continue to study, more and more, I realize that Buddhism is about, um, you. I, I guess you could call it deconditioning, like unsamskara-ing, like that that's actually what Buddhism is, the practice is actually entirely about, is that we are entirely very conditioned and we need to sort of undo that conditioning. Now, there's two things about that that I want to note. In terms of our 12 link dependent origination, I wanted you to remember that in terms of dependencies, vijnana consciousness is dependent upon samskara. And what that means is, is that if you don't have any samskara, there's just no place for vijnana. There's, there are not the conditions for vijnana. And if there's no vijnana, then there's no nama rupa, there's no six senses, there's no contact, there's no sensation, there's no craving, there's none of the rest. That's the important message about the 12 link chain of causation. So if, as I think it is, if Buddhism is about the process of de-samskarification and you succeeded in getting rid of habitual karmic energy, succeeded in getting rid of that habit energy, there would be no consciousness. There would be no nama rupa. There would be no contact. There would be no sensations. There would be no more craving. But what does that mean to get rid of samskara? Well, at a very superficial level, we are talking about these habitual reactions to things in terms of, ooh, gimme, 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 <laughs> or get that away from me, get that away from me. So at the very, very basic level, we have these habitual tendencies to either cling to or move away from. But even if we could get kind of rid of those sort of basic conditioned behaviors of wanting and not wanting and all of that, we would then start, we would then be in a position to deal with the deeper conditioning, which is the subject object duality, that fabrication of a sense of self 
based upon the fabrication of what is not self. And what I'm getting at is, is that if you could really start to get rid of even that type of dualistic conditioning, notice that there would no longer be the subject object relationship to be in a vijnana situation with. And so what I'm getting at is, is that you can only crave and have tanha for what is delusionally perceived to be not you. I don't have craving for my hand because it's here all the time. It's like mine. I only crave that which I think is not mine that I somehow think could I could draw in to be mine in some way. But what if this delusion of self disappears and there is no me in it? How could there be craving? Craving for what? By whom? But in such a state as that, where there's no more samskara, and so there's no more vijnana and no more all the rest, it's not that we're zombies. It's not that we're brain dead idiots. No, we are no longer dualistically functioning in terms of subject object. And now we're in a state of mind, not vijnana, but a mind state in that sense. And then that chitta could be bodhicitta. It could be awakened chitta. Or it could not be awakened chitta. <laughs> but my point is, is it's not vijnana because it's not in that dreamy, the, the long night of ignorance. It's not in that dreamy dualistic state of me and it. And it's why in Dharma doors, I spend so much time analyzing that idea of me and it and really examining, well, where does that idea of me and it come from? And the reason why I spend so much time on that is because if we could understand that, then we would actually remove the foundation for craving that happens, you know, kind of way later in that way, but we're sort of cutting it off at the pass, so to speak. All right, any questions, comments, answers, ideas? What's there to say, right? Yeah, Jenny. Oh, can I do it? Hmm? Oh, I did it. Jenny, I did it. It comes to language, you know, right? I mean, because this all just seems like a giant loop. And the samskara is caused from our conditioning, right? Our conditioning is based on the idea of things because of our language, like because that's a roll of toilet paper. And especially at the beginning of the pandemic, we we're all freaking out about toilet paper. And so we have this commonality of experience and language. And oh my God, it, it came so full circle when you were talking. Like I saw like where the chain gets broken, right? Because we're dependent upon our language. How we see pink changes from person to person because we can't, we don't all see the same. And I don't really know where I'm going now with this, but um, really it just comes down to the language and that we're attached and we need to be really in so many ways in order to just go to the grocery market or, you know, just function in whatever this realm is. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Okay. On that note, real quick, I do want to say, I meant to say this earlier. It's a very important point. So as I often share with everybody about this, that this of course is my scarf. This isn't, I don't know this roll of toilet paper business, but the form, the Nama Rupa, the form of this is a scarf. And look, it's a scarf. Like for real. 
my point is, is that we don't want to like throw the roll of toilet paper away exactly. And meaning that the idea of getting rid of samskara is not again, becoming a zombie where it's like, I don't know what it is. It's more about being aware of, oh, toilet paper because behind. Scarf because cold. And we realize, oh, it's a, it's a hearing aid, it's a little hat, it's a pillow, it's, it's everything. And so my point is, is that we don't get rid of the knowledge that this is conventionally called a roll of toilet paper. What we're doing is, is not being so locked in and rigidly attached to that that's all it is. And that's true of everything. It's true of everybody, not boxing it people into specific ideas and categories either. So I just want to make that really important point that it's not about getting kind of rid of the language as actually being poets in that sense and being freed uh, or free with language, I guess is what I want to say. So on that note, let's conclude this Dharma Doors. Um, I think we'll probably put this sutra to rest. I'll take a look at the rest of it this week and see for next week. But otherwise, stay tuned till next Sunday for more Dharma Doors fun. Thanks, everybody. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.